Yeah, uh, so far uh, we have talked about the geometric inequalities and how other flows and the inverse mean coefficient flow uh, are used to show such inequalities. And now uh, in the last part, uh, I want to focus on my lizard. So, uh, so my lizard is about the non-compact solutions. Uh, so. Previously, all the flows were defined for compact surfaces or some compact curves. But what we can talk about non-compact cases, uh, for the mean curvature flow, uh, there, there is a result by Huiskin and uh, Aker. Aker and Huiskin, uh, they showed uh, for any graph, if it's for any Lipschitz graph, uh, there is a solution to the uh, mean curvature flow. But we have no idea on what, what could happen for the inverse mean culture flow, even for the convex case. So to explain the idea, uh, I want to review uh, some relevant theorem, theories uh, in the inverse mean culture flow. So first of all, uh, I want to talk about the regularity of compact Come star-shaped solutions. So Huiskin and Ilmanen uh, showed uh, the following estimates. Suppose uh, my initial surface is star-shaped uh, and mean convex. If Suppose I don't know whether uh, this star's initial surface has a curvature bound or mean curvature lower bound. We just know it's mean convex. Then they derive this following uh, priori estimate that uh, using this constant R1 and R2, which comes from the geometry, uh, the speed one over H uh, is bounded by uh, this R1, R2, and initial uh, mass, initial area, like, and speed is bounded like this. So that means if your H was zero initially, that means speed was infinite initially, uh, the speed becomes bounded immediately uh, like as a function of one over square root of T. We, uh, in, in PDE, this is so-called a local estimate in time. Uh, I, will, yeah, I will explain why this is related with non-compact solutions uh, later. Another relevant result uh, is if mean curvature is bounded above and below by some positive number, uh, then one could show the second fundamental form uh, is bounded as well. So uh, in terms of PDE, again, it means uh, if H is bounded above and below by positive constant, uh, then my equation is uniformly parabolic and I have higher order regularity estimate. So that means I can uh, create solution and solution exists as long as uh, these bounds holds. So uh, most of the theories in, of showing the existence of solution uh, is, uh, yeah, that the main, main goal is to find uh, these two bounds. As long as I have them, uh, I can continue my solution. And the upper bound uh, is easy because if you if you if you see the evolution of H, uh, it just uh, satisfies the maximum principle. So yeah, so the main difficulty is to find some lower bound. Now uh, let's let's think about what is the easiest possible uh, non-compact solution. Uh, so suppose uh, my gamma t is a solution of inverse mean curvature flow in the sphere. Then uh, the important example uh, 
observation uh, I, I really want to emphasize is the following. So if you generate uh, a cone, so viewing my SN as a surface in Rn plus one, you can generate a cone uh, from this gamma sub t. Let's denote this cone by C of gamma sub t. Then, uh, yeah, this is a picture which explains this situation. Then on a point with distance r, uh, the mean curvature uh, is exactly one over r times the mean curvature of the point uh, on the radius one. So that's the mean curvature at this point uh, Rx. So using this, uh, since inverse mean curvature flow, uh, my speed has to be inverse proportional to the h. Uh, we can show that uh, this gamma sub t, if we generate the cone, this is again the solution, a solution to the inverse mean curvature flow in Rn plus one. Of course, even if my, even if we assume gamma t is smooth, uh, my solution uh, is not smooth at the origin. Uh, so it's it's not a classical solution. It's classical solution except the origin. But that's very important example that will be used. Uh, so the among those solution, uh, the simplest one uh, I can think of is when my gamma uh, is a uh, round uh, geodesic sphere in the sphere. So when my initial gamma zero uh, is a geodesic sphere, uh, it expands and, and it is still geodesic sphere. And one could show that in a finite time, uh, it converges to an equator. So if my initial angle is theta zero in this picture, uh, this theta zero uh, opens up uh, so theta zero becomes zero. So my cone opens up in a finite time, uh, say T star. So my, yeah, cone becomes flat. And the, and, and the relevant result uh, is by Gerhardt and Makowski and Schur, uh, 15 and 16. They showed if initial surface uh, is smooth, strictly convex, then the solution of inverse mean culture flow exists uh, until it converges to an equator. So one notable thing is that it converges to an equator in a finite time, and we don't know which equator it converges to. And another observation we can make is we can actually find what is my uh, this uh, large T is, uh, let's see. So, so if you remember this gamma sub T uh, has this area E exponential of T times the initial area. And when it converges to the equator, it has to have the area of this uh, great circle. So that gives me yeah, that gives me what my large T should be. So your, your large T is determined by initial area. So similarly, for the round cone case, uh, we can compute uh, this T star. Okay, uh, so this, so that's, uh, so, Using this kind of observation, uh, the result of Daskalapus and Huiskin uh, in 2017 is the following. Suppose my M naught uh, is a smooth surface, which is convex entire graph. Uh, 
Moreover, another assumption is it's a graph and the height function is in between a two round cone. Yeah, so there are two round cones that bounds my surface. Moreover, uh, they assumed uh, the mean curvature uh, is bounded by one over kind of distance uh, from above and below. So the second thing assumes my h behaves like one over x. Then they showed the smooth solution exists until some large time t. And this large time t is exactly the time when my cone uh, becomes flat or the gamma zero becomes an equator. So the hardest part of their proof is to show the lower bound of the H. But remember, my solution is looking like a cone. That means uh, even later time, my H behaves like one over the distance. So I no longer have a uniform bound of H from below, but my bound has to be local because yeah, we cannot expect a global lower bound. So they use some uh, iteration. Yeah, they use some integral method. Uh, yeah, some Stampakia iteration kind of thing uh, to show this uh, lower bound. That was the hardest part. So, so that was the uh, model case. Uh, and, and my lizard with Daskalapus uh, is to show the existence of solution for general convex hypersurface. Moreover, we want to remove this condition that my surface is between two cone or my surface has some curvature condition. So to state the result, uh, we need some concepts. Uh, the first thing is this concept of uh, tangent cone at infinity. Uh, so if you have walked on minimal surfaces or uh, Einstein equations, uh, you, then you will definitely know what it is. If we have a non-convex, non-compact hypersurface, uh, then there is some unique cone that is asymptotic to my surface at infinity. The way we obtain this, uh, you can, we can just take the scale down because it's uh, convex. Each, as, as we scale down, uh, my set or outside surface shrinks uh, monoton, yeah, mono, shrinks monoton in a monotone way. So we, we obtain some unique cone and we will say that is a a tangent cone at infinity. So yeah, let me state the theorem. Uh, so uh, the theorem uh, says, suppose my initial surface uh, is a boundary of some non-compact convex, <clears throat> non-compact convex set M0 hat. And this M0 hat has a tangent cone at infinity, uh, say uh, cone generated gamma zero hat. This is tangent cone at infinity of uh, this thing, uh, M zero hat. Then I could show the solution to the inverse mean curvature flow exists for time zero to large T and the large T is exactly given by uh, this gamma zero. So the gamma zero uh, is the link when I, uh, yeah, gamma zero is this link when I take the intersection uh, between the sphere. So my large T uh, is just the uh, ratio between the equator uh, and this area of gamma zero, which I denote by this perimeter of gamma zero hat. Uh, gamma zero hat is this inside. Uh, yeah, and that could be uh, zero to infinite. Uh, when it's zero, uh, there's no solution. 
yeah, we showed this large T is maximal in the sense that there's no other solution that exists uh, longer than this large T. Moreover, for each MT, for each MT, uh, if I uh, find the asymptotic con at infinity of this solution MT, uh, that should be uh, the gamma T, which is a solution which is the solution to the mean, inverse mean curvature flow learning from gamma zero. So my solution uh, asymptotically at infinity is looking like the uh, solution to the inverse mean curvature flow from a cone. Yeah, so the behavior is uh, in general guided by this behavior of asymptotic cone. So, so for that reason, uh, since my cone becomes flat in a finite time, this large T, uh, my solution also becomes flat uh, as time approaches to large T. That's the statement of the theorem. So one reason why I didn't write this, uh, why I use this perimeter instead of this area of gamma zero is the following. So <clears throat> your asymptotic cone uh, could uh, degenerate, meaning that suppose your, uh, your initial surface is not like a cone, but it's a uh, say super linear function. Then after the blow down, what you just get is this uh, some some line, half line, half line becomes your asymptotic cone. So you don't have any area for that. Or sometimes uh, it could be uh, some line or something like that. So we, we, we find that uh, in that case, we have to measure not this area, but two times this area. That's the, so if you have, this gamma zero, if your gamma zero is like a line in S2, then two times of this is exactly the uh, smallest possible uh, area of some surface that contains this gamma zero. Okay, so we, we yeah, so this theorem actually yeah, describe non-compact solutions or convex assumptions. And if you remember, this inverse mean culture flow uh, has a very nice scaling property uh, that if I just multiply by lambda, then I get another solution. And that's, that's why we could expect uh, this kind of result. Uh, if my M0 has a solution, then scale down, if I scale down the solution, then it should be again a solution. And if I scale down and down, I will see a cone. Uh, so that's how conical solution and uh, MT are related. Then uh, we can do think uh, in a different way. Uh, suppose uh, my initial surface uh, has a singularity so, so, so the typical example is this. Suppose my initial surface uh, is convex and let's assume for now compact. If my initial surface uh, contains these kind of singular point, so I, if I didn't assume any regularity assumption, uh, then since it's convex, there, the singularity points uh, are looking like some uh, cones after we take the blow up. Uh, and since inverse mean culture flow has very nice scaling property, uh, we could expect that this uh, singularity also evolves uh, by the inverse mean culture flow. That's our, that was our expectation and uh, with my collaborator, Peking Hong, uh, in 2018, uh, we were able to prove uh, this result uh, that I just explained. Uh, yeah, th that I just explained. 
So uh, suppose uh, initial origin is a singular point, uh, say uh, like here. Suppose uh, this is my origin. And if I take the bow up, uh, suppose I don't see a plane, but I, I do see some cone. Then under the inverse mean culture flow, uh, which is stupidly, suitably uh, defined because it's no longer a classical solution. Uh, so if my, my MT, uh, so MT contains this origin until this tangent cone becomes flat. Moreover, tangent cone evolves by the inverse mean curvature flow. So we can exactly compute when it becomes flat. So, so this example of cube uh, is very interesting. So it has uh, two different kinds of singularity. One is at the corner and one is at the edge. At the corner, uh, if I magnify, uh, then I do have this picture on the right hand side. And if you compute the area ratio between the initial link and the uh, <clears throat> initial link and the equator, uh, the initial link uh, meets three right angles. Uh, so that's why I get uh, three times uh, pi over two. And the uh, equator has uh, four times pi over two. So log of this minus log of that, uh, you get log of four over three. So what we could show is on this uh, corner, uh, this corner doesn't move until this time log of four over three. That's very precise. And that's very nice thing about the inverse mean curvature flow. The area growth uh, gives so, yeah, so detailed, uh, what is it? Yeah, gives so detailed information that even tells me, yeah, when my solution becomes smooth. After it becomes flat, uh, now my point moves and the singularity uh, is removed and my solution becomes uh, smooth. That's for this eight edges. What about this? Uh, oh, sorry, that's for eight corners. What about this points on the edge? On the edge, uh, if you if you blow up, then we view we do have this kind of wedge. And if you compute the same, suppose this is the origin. If you compute the same uh, ratio, then you get t equals to zero. That means my solution on the edge, they these point immediately becomes smooth and they move outside. So now uh, I, I really like to make some animation on this. So if you have uh, some very nice simulator or some way to simulate this, I, I really appreciate. Uh, but yeah, we can imagine how this solution evolves. So these eight corners uh, will stay there until this time. And then my solution becomes uh, immediately becomes strictly convex, means uh, this faces uh, becomes convex. And my edges becomes smooth immediately. So and then it, it yeah, in, it, and, then, and then it inflates. So after log of four over three, my solution is convex smooth. So by some of previous theorem, it converges to a round sphere uh, after the scaling. Yeah, so combining, and this research also holds for non-compact solutions. So combining these two theorems, uh, we kind of has, have a complete picture of how uh, convex large surfaces in uh, RN 
Rn plus one evolves by the inverse mean culture flow. And let's do some, yeah, that's this. So that's for weak solution. And if we just want to know when my solution has a smooth solution, uh, we have a uh, complete characterization of such uh, condition. That's exactly when my singularities uh, have, uh, as, as like this edge case, uh, has t equals to zero. In other words, uh, you can you can uh, we know there's some definition of density in minimal surface, uh, which is the limit of a area ratio between my uh, link and the Euclidean sphere, or Euclidean ball and my area inside. And yeah, singularity will be removed immediately if and only if every point in my initial surface uh, has density equal to one. Yeah, that's that's quite very interesting yeah, result. And one can ask, uh, when, when my density becomes one uh, for convex hypersurface? Of course, if the tangent cone is a plane, then density is obviously one. And moreover, uh, we observed this kind of wedge has density one. And uh, by some elementary lemma, uh, Pekin and I had showed that uh, these are the only case. So in order to a density to be one, uh, your, uh, yeah, your, your surface has to be uh, this kind of uh, so your tangent cone has to be this kind of wedge times uh, r k uh, r n minus one. Yeah, so that's why we say this is an edge wedge. Yeah. Uh, here, here is the yeah. Here is the thing. Yeah. Our solution has to be looking like this. So uh, in the remaining time, uh, I don't have meant much time, but I want to talk about some of the main estimate that allow us to show this kind of existence result. Uh, so Let's have some break and I will resume with these theorems. Okay, uh, I'm back. In this last part, uh, yeah, last part of this talk, I'd like to talk about um, yeah, the main estimate and how did I show the existence. So uh, as I explained, um, the critical estimate is the estimate of h from below, or in other words, uh, upper bound on the speed one over h. And since my solution is looking like a cone, uh, we don't expect a uniform lower bound of uh, h. So the statement of main a priori estimate is the following. Suppose uh, my solution is convex compact uh, inverse mean culture flow and for somehow uh, i know that uh, my solution uh, stays above some cone with this angle delta my cone now is a round cone i suppose uh, um, yeah my solution is stays above there And, and yeah, good. And the important thing that's not only of in the initial time, but suppose I know that it's evolved this cone up to time large t. Yeah, so this, this expression here just means uh, my w is this upward vector, and f is the position vector. So I'm saying that just saying that this. Uh, solution stays above this round cone of angle 
delta or if you lead this angle angle pi over two minus delta then from this condition uh, estimate tells me i have the bound of one over h with some weight given by uh, this right hand side uh, and yeah so so this h times f makes my estimate uh, scaling, yeah, uh, scale invariant. And this also proves my h will be very proportional to f. Uh, that's kind of expected because my cone uh, behaves like that. Moreover, uh, the estimate uh, does not depend on the initial bounds of H from above or below. Uh, again, that's why this uh, estimate is called a local estimate in time. And this is very, uh, very much uh, uh, affected by the estimate of uh, Huyskin and Ilmanen. Yeah, so and my C only depends on this angle. So as long as some cone is supporting my solution from outside, I have some bound on speed uh, like this. So that is a kind of sharp estimate. So that allows my uh, conical solution, my solution uh, does not move infinitely fast before it becomes flat. And yeah, th this proof uh, uses uh, just the maximum principle. And, and while we prove this, uh, we, we developed the same similar method and could prove the result of Huiskin and Ilmanen uh, for star-shaped solution uh, using maximum principle. Uh, their proof uses uh, yeah, Stampakia iteration. But yeah, we found another way uh, to the same result. Okay, uh, then you suppose we have this uh, estimate and the way uh, the existence of solution is quite straightforward. Uh, for initial surface M0, uh, we can approximate, we can exhaust uh, this M0 from inside by compact convex hypersurfaces Mi0. Then we can flow this mi zero by inverse mean curvature flow by and denote by m i t. Uh, then I can define uh, m t, uh, which is non-compact solution, as the limit of uh, this m i t as i goes to infinite. Yeah, these these families are very useful because they are monotone in i and t by avoidance principle. And we, we, we need to show this uh, M0 is smooth solution, uh, which, uh, yeah, which is non-empty non, non until the time we suggest it. And yeah, and, and then, and then the, the next thing I, I will just briefly explain is we put, we, yeah, uh, we put some barriers outside, uh, consists of conical solutions. Such conical solutions, uh, or is it uh, prohibits my solution goes infinite uh, before this conical solution becomes flat. And using these cons, uh, we can apply our a priori estimate that gives me a bound on one over H, uh, some local bound on one over H. Then we can uh, pass to a limit using, uh, as I mentioned, the equation becomes uniformly parabolic when I have bound on H from above and below. So yeah, that's how we showed the existence. So then uh, how did we obtain this bound of H from below? Uh, so that was actually from more classical estimate on the second fundamental form uh, in the mean curvature flow. Yeah, so uh, this is so-called interior C2 estimate. Uh, so Aker and Huiskin in 91 uh, showed uh, if we have a bound on the gradient, 
the second fundamental form could be bounded uh, local in time and space. Their idea is the following. Uh, if we look at the evolution of a gradient term like this, here my u is the height function of the graph, then it has this uh, very nice minus term. And they, they uh, these three people, uh, this uh, Caparelli, Nirenberg, and Spruck, uh, has developed some trick uh, that we can use of this nice term uh, in, a, in an extreme way. So they, they think of some test functions like this that gives me some additional term here. So that, that, that allow us to show this uh, interior C2 estimate. Uh, if if this, is, this was just one like this, uh, then it's insufficient. But after using this trick, uh, we obtain some additional minus and that, that makes whole thing possible. What happens uh, for the inverse mean curvature flow? Instead of the gradient, uh, suppose we uh, compute the evolution of the distance squared. Then we have this minus of one over h squared. So previously to compute the bound of second, second fundamental form, the evolution of the gradient gives me minus of uh, second fundamental form. And now evolution of distance squared gives me minus of speed squared. So from there, uh, yeah, now the remainder is uh, some, some complicated trial and error thing, but the idea is make use of this uh, distance squared and also we think of some, uh, some tricks like this Caparelli, Nirenberg, and Sprock. So when we found some nice test function and that allow us to show the estimate on compact star-shaped case. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't want to explain all the details here. So, how about the non-compact case? Uh, previous case was the compact star-shaped case. Now for the non-compact solution, instead of looking at the distance, I look at the angle. Uh, so I, I want to draw it uh, in a detailed way. Suppose this is my solution, then and this is my origin. This is my uh, x n plus one x's. Then we can think of this angle theta, which is which uh, is made by my point on the surface, the origin, and this uh, x n plus one x's. It's very looking unnatural quantity. But if I compute the evolution of theta, uh, which was a bit painful, but if I compute that, I got this uh, minus of desired term squared. Of course, there is some some term, some some weird term like this, but I have this. So in so we I use my I make use of this term uh, by looking at some test function of this form. So instead of the Caffarelli Nirenberg prox uh, trick, uh, I I use some some function sequence, and I multiply by some number c which is greater than one. Yeah, that that gives a similar effect and I could I could get the estimate on uh, this one over h squared times f squared. Okay, so that gives me yeah the a priori estimate on one over h for non-compact solutions. So that yeah that was the main estimate uh, and yeah that's the key step. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was the end of my talk. Uh,
So I want to give you some reference, especially for the uh, geometric inequalities part, 